hello and greetings to each and every one of you in your respected places. Welcome to Conversations in the Nick of Time. This is, yes, we are shifting gears a little bit. This is the destination for mentoring moments with global influence. And we have here so many guests who are um, experts in their own rights and just honored as your host, Nikki Roach, to bring you um, individuals who are either a part of my network or joining my network and allowing them to provide insight in regards to their leadership excellence, accidents, and equity. And it is just absolutely always um, insightful, even for me. While I'm a host, I am always and forever a student. Just want to real quick give a shout out to our partners and sponsors, Ah TV Network, ALA Public Relations, um, All In Music and Media, KSTL Jubilee, 690 AM, Mosaic Ceiling, and Sparkman Publications. Thank you to each of you for your support. Um, we are so appreciative of all that you do for us. So... As we move forward, I talked about networks, and today I am beyond honored. You have no idea how honored I am to bring to you, um, yes, someone I'm a fan of. I am a huge fan of Russ Finkelstein. Russ Finkelstein. You may not be familiar with the name, but I promise you, you're familiar with the work. So Russ Finkelstein, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I, I, I love, uh, I love the starting point of not familiar with the name of familiar with the work. Cause I think in many respects, uh, that's how I like to be in the world, honestly. Yeah. And, and, and that is how <laughs> you honestly show up. And it is just amazing to me, your footprint that after doing my research and, and I'm going to share with our listening audience who you are. And some things that your fingerprints are on currently. Um, and this is an abbreviated list. It, please hear me when I say abbreviated list. I like um, to keep myself busy. That's <laughs> There's too much to do. There's always too much to do. Listen, I said I'm lazy. What's up with <laughs> doing my, my research? I'm like, I, I need to find another light or cone. <laughs> So Russ Finkelstein, he is a career coach, social entrepreneur, and advisor to founders. He is currently the director of coaching with the Roddenberry Fellowship. And those of you who are not familiar, this is a U.S.-based fellowship awarded to extraordinary leaders and advocates who use new and innovative strategies to safeguard human rights and ensure an equal and just society for all. The individual who inspired this fellowship, and it's actually a foundation, and then there's a number of other initiatives that they support, was Eugene Wesley Roddenberry Sr., the American television screenwriter, producer, and the creator of Star Trek. That's who this, this fella, Russ, that I'm talking about, is serving for. He's also the coaching residence for the Starting Block Fellowship. This is a community that exceeds more than 3,100 individuals from like 56 countries all over the world. And they bring these individuals in um, as a cohort and they develop their leadership skills. Um, so he is the coach in residence there. He is the founder of the noted careers website, theidealist.org. And he spent 14 plus years there leading this. And this is the global directory for the nonprofit sector with millions of opportunities where subscribers subscribers get a chance to go online to learn more about opportunities, jobs, internships, volunteer opportunities that interest them. Um, Russ was also chosen both as Generation Z and the LGBTQ influencer by LinkedIn. Big deal, right? And if that wasn't enough, again, this is abbreviated. Never enough. It's just never enough. He is the one of the writers. Um, and I am just up to my neck with some of his articles that we're going to jump into a little later. But he's a writer for the Washington Post. And again, that's just abbreviated. So, Russ, I am beyond grateful for you making time 
um, to join us on this day. It is my pleasure. I I live to serve. I mean, I, I love to be useful. Like that's always my it's always my goal. So I'm very happy to be here. And I and I also just love the spirit that you bring to supporting others. So happy to help in any way. Wonderful. And that's exactly what we're both here to do, um, to provide some information. And I just want to just jump right in and get to know you just a little bit more outside sure. of the accolades just mentioned. But, you know, how is it um, that you even landed to start? Um, let's just start with idealists, because that kind of put you in a in a, in a global space. Yeah, I mean, so it's really it's it's. <laughs> I guess it's just, it's not unfamiliar to lots of people, but I was one of those folks who not a whole lot was predicted. I, I wasn't someone that that you know, guidance counselors or others had thought was going to achieve a whole lot in the world. And I think that sparked something. I think the frustration and annoyance of that uh, sparked something in me that continues to this day to be something that motivates me to do more. Um, that, that, so out of, I, I, when I was in college, I was going to have to drop out for financial reasons. And I stumbled on this program that helped people. They took time off from college, uh, that was working with inner city kids in Washington, DC. And I realized like my passion was for potential. Like, I love the idea of how you help people discover what's the thing that they care most about. Uh, and in that job in DC, I realized how much guidance counselors overall, like having a good guidance counselor may determine whether a kid has access to possibilities or not. And so idealist was in part the result of thinking about how we need to make information, having equal access to information opportunities really important. So it was at the starting point where search engines were just beginning. Yeah. Most of the ones that existed at that time have long fallen out of anyone's remembering. Uh, and so like I just that the, that was what motivated me. And from doing that, I realized that you have this interesting challenge that organizations are looking for good people on staff or to volunteer and that lots of people want to find a way to commit their time or their or their service time or their working time to doing work that matters. And so how do you serve as a bridge? And I think that, you know, that theme of how do you serve as a bridge has just always been, you know, that I've always thought that I want to serve to bridge as many people to as many possibilities as I can. So I in, tend to insert myself. Uh, and have probably made that more of the a theme in my life. Uh, and and it's there are trade-offs when you when you want to be a bridge because uh, it there's you're not looking for the spotlight. You're looking to be the conduit, and that's a different role often. So, but, yeah, but not but not everyone has the ego. Yeah. To even we start off wanting to be a bridge, but many of us, um, when we talk about mentors and being the bridge, it can get sticky along the way. It, it can. And actually, people will look at you initially and they'll wonder, so what is in it for you? And even now, you know, I ended up, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, that I wrote this document about why I'm doing, I shared this document. So I, I have a policy. Every week, uh, I will I have conversations with a number of people who are starting up something or looking to make a career transition, and they're confused as to why I make myself available to them. So I just wrote up this like two page thing about why am I doing this? Because the question would come up, and it's a it is a natural question because I don't think it's necessarily the norm for folks. Uh, and I found like it's just a way to get across. Like I think it's it it feeds a part of me. Yeah. So it just very much feeds a part of me and the the belief that we have the opportunity uh, to do more and to do good. And, you know, and I was lucky. In some respects, I worked hard. I worked with good people. And the thing, the first thing I started took off and people felt I had to know something. So, you know, I'm a big believer if you have some standing, 
standing can be used in different ways. It could be used to get yourself lots more opportunities and make more. It can be used um, to have more influence in different circles. And for me, it felt like standing was about how do I help other people perhaps gain access to that and, and be credible as a person who might help them believe in themselves or see more in themselves. Yeah, I know it was interesting. So we had the um, beautiful pl privilege and pleasure of being virtually connected by yeah. Allison Brewer. And um, she and I had met, we connected immediately. And mm -hmm. she mentioned, there's somebody you need to know. You all remind me of each other because I too am very passionate um, about access, about exposure, about education. And at the end of the day, it's all about being educated on opportunities. And yeah. so for me in my world, um, I've been very fortunate with my parents um, giving me the exposure and the um, advancement in life in different ways. However, as I began to make progress, uh, pr progress within my academic career and my professional career, even personal, um, I realized okay, I'm an African-American woman, like mm -hmm. we didn't get access to a lot of information mm -hmm. as we were moving up. And, you know, there's, you know, you, you begin to hang around your circle changes and shifts, but at the same time, you're kind of reaching for the same thing. And it's like, there's no scarcity. There's no limit of resources. We just don't know where to go. Yeah. And so when I met you, you, I mean, you just went right in to where it's like, hey, this is what I do, but you were very, very humble and very simple with your explanation. And you were like, how, what is it that you, what do you see for yourself? Like you went right in on me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes I have these things. So where I met Allison was through starting block and I would have, so one of these things that I would do is when I was there, I'd have four or five days and I'd have 30 minute meetings with one-on-one -on -one with like 120 people that like for me that's a very weird like weird superpower is like I have an ability to like do that and be very present and kind of love that now I'm exhausted at the end of it yeah but like, it's one of those things where it's so like it's so exceptional to be able to meet people and to solve problems and serve as a conduit and one of the great things, uh, there's not there's not always a super long list that people mention of the great things about getting older, uh, but one of the great things is that you can pull from so many people and experiences and you have just a greater breath. So if I'm talking to very different people, um, that state, I can be helpful to this broad range of folks. And even like at every single, I love to go to events in part because you meet exceptional and really compelling people. So when I met Allison, I was like, here's someone who has a view of the world that's fascinating, yeah. it's different, and I don't want them to feel as though um, the fact that they are an outlier yeah. means that there's no place for them. Yeah. And so I think, I think, and the challenge is, I think for many people, they feel like, oh, someone like me can't find their way, won't find their people, won't be able to fit in. And and their people means a variety of designations to people. And often it's a it's a it's a set of these things. Yeah. And so I think that's often the challenge. Yeah. And it's so interesting that you bring up um the fact because I share that same space in regards to like the, the more different you may think you are, the more like, okay, let's sit and talk. I want to learn from you. Um, I want to see how I can shift my way of thinking about the world and through my lived experiences and your shared experiences, what new can we do? You know, right. what, what else can we job, jump into? Right. <laughs> and so I would go when I was at Idealist, I would go to random conferences because I love the idea of like understanding how a segment. So like I went to a, a, a conference for reference librarians and I will admit, I kind of had a crush on what? reference librarians as a group group Cause I was like, Oh, they have access to like information. Like that's so great that you understand where all the stuff is, but it's so interesting to see what the norms are and the ways of thinking that people have. Yeah. 
And we're so siloed and the ability to like cross those silos and learn and connect is just, it's amazing. Like it's, if your head works in that way around synthesis, like, oh, and, and for networking, a lot of that, like the ability to retain and remember information about people, about what makes them tick, mm-hmm. what's without feeling like, oh, the purpose here is to, is, you know, the strict mining idea of what am I getting? What am I getting? What I'm getting, but how do I create more? Yeah. Right. That shift from the scarcity mindset to this notion of like, there's so much out there and how do we choose and how do we recognize like not everything's going to be for me, but here's the thing that might be perfect for this other person. And how do I make sure they find out about it? Right. And so when I have guests on, I am often, um, there's a word that just lands in my spirit. <laughs> and the word for you that came up, you know, here on my Nick notes is <laughs> um, strategy, which is a noun. And mm-hmm. strategy is defined as a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major or overall aim, a careful plan or method. Then the third one says an adaptation or complex of adaptations, such as behavior or structure that mm-hmm. serves or appears to serve an important function in achieving evolutionary success. And mm-hmm. that's what I think of when I think of the work that you do. And how has strategy influenced your work? And 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 cuz to me yeah. Even meeting with a hundred and something people for 30 minutes like that ha- that takes some strategy. Well, one, you go in quickly, <laughs> you get to the point, you learn like, okay, we have a limited time together. There's going to be like, I'm a, I, I, when I do something like I don't build in bathroom breaks, like I'm just like, I'm here, like focus, I'm with you. Completely. So some of it is like knowing like, you know, when I need space, it's understanding, like trying to develop tools. Mm-hmm. There are specific challenges. So people often have a challenge around like, I don't know what I want to do, or I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to build something. And so most often you'd have stuff like that come up or I'm in a place that's difficult and why is it difficult and like helping them to sort of figure out what are the the main buckets of issues that often come up without simultaneously being too prescriptive at the start, like giving them a not over forcing what you believe is the issue. I'm also a pre-work person. So with 120 people, I will ask people, I'll say, here's a bunch of questions. What the work, what's the work that you want to make sure we're able to do in this time? And I'll read all of it. I'll write notes. I'll think about the people I want them to meet. So I I make up for other shortcomings or other challenges I face by, by that. And just honestly, the joy and problem solving, like that motivates me. So it's, for me, it's this weird, my head is a very strange place. Uh, and I love both big, messy, complex problems um, that are broad, societal or structural and really making an individual feel seen. And so that thing is really I like, it's it. just, it's just a weird, like, I'm just a weird combination of things. And so, you know, I want to make sure that that person feels like if this is the only chance so what I will tell people when I have my rule of I'll meet with anybody, um, because I think that's important, because when I was younger, I would have done well to have met with someone who I thought knew stuff, um, is that I will, that this is the first time we're meeting. It may, we can potentially meet further, but typically it requires that there's some work I need you to do between oh. the first meeting and the second meeting. And for most people, like their ability to follow through or execute after that is a little tougher, is a little harder. And that tends to kind of vet some folks out. Or I will go and say, you know what? I think given where you are, I think this is the resource. This is the resource or person that I think can help you. Because the other thing that's true is sometimes we're connectors Mm -hmm. and sometimes we're the person who's going to do the work with someone. And I don't suffer from this notion that I have to be the answer. I think... I want, I want to help you find the answer. And there are times when the answer might be me. But for many people, the person that they need to help them on their journey is someone who has a different life experience, you know, lived experience, like career, like there are arcs that are going to help them that are going to be incredibly important. That if, if we're going to get them to maximize their choices and make informed decisions, 
then I want to make sure that the best person do that. And it doesn't have to be me. And in fact, if it always was me, then we'd have a big problem because right. like. And it's not sustainable. Yeah. That's not sustainable yeah. for you to be all yeah. to everyone, even just that one group that you were meeting with. Um, and then you have these other um, cohorts of fellows that you're meeting with. Um, we've not even tapped into, you know, yes, you do have a personal life, right? So like all those different things that come into play. So there has to be a strategy. So th this is interesting. The one thing that you mentioned that I myself need to lean into and pay attention to is this pre-work yeah. formula. I can see that how that's beneficial because in my professional space, we do a lot of that. Yep. But in regards to being um, a mentor, being um, an advisor, even a consultant, you know, going in to do some things, there is some pre-work that sometimes that is asked or that I request if I go in before I attend um, or show up to facilitate a session just to have that background of prepare, which is still strategy. Yeah. But so the other thing is, so it's pre-work. So I am can give maximize the time we have together. But it's also post work because I say this to people and it's only mildly insulting uh, <laughs> is that I don't completely trust what you say. I trust what you write because I think that's going to be something that you will have be thoughtful. I will always say, here's some questions. Here's an exercise. Do it. It'll take you X amount of time. Step away for a day or two. Come back and review and make sure it still feels correct. Because I want them, you know, I'm a big fan of people scoring, ranking, because I think we tend to have to make big girl and big boy choices. Okay. Life, unfortunately, presents. And I want them to make, to be really thoughtful about that. Because I think- And that accountability. There's some accountability there. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of it is also like recognizing that we all feel anxiety and guilt for lots of things. Yeah. And the more we can clear away things that are secondary or tertiary, yeah. the better. The more it opens up space and allows us to make decisions that are like, okay, here's really the stuff that matters yeah. versus the, the less significant things that often kind of can kind of gum up the works in, in our process and make us feel frenzied about all the things we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. That's wow. Okay. So there's the pre-work, there's the post-work. I'm going to actually be intentional about that and be more strategic about that because I can see how that would save a lot of um, time when you are face-to-face, -face, but then there's also um, alignment. Like we know where we're coming to deal with. It's no different than, you know, someone saying, okay, I want to, we're going to have a meeting. Well, what's the agenda? Yeah. Um, but I like you going a step further to where, I mean, you're going to have to lean in if you're asking for this time because time mm -hmm. is precious and we only have so much because what is it? There's 24 hours in a day. You've got, they say we need to be sleeping for eight of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. if we go to a job for eight, that's almost half of the time. Right. 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 So right. it's like being mindful of how it is that we address these 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 requests um because the more you start doing and i want people to understand this the more you start doing the more people are going to be attracted but i think this also allows i don't want to say weed people out but it causes them to be serious right it it just it allows us to go and say here's someone who i i always will say i cannot put in more effort in your life than you're yes. putting so yeah. I think some of it, I think I think much of it is that I think probably you and I also share a particular quality around being like servant leaders and the challenge of of wanting to serve, to help people be their best selves is of scale, is of recognizing, you know, who am I investing in a lot myself and thinking about like where, where and when, you know, you make choices. So there are particular people most often, so I've doing a lot of work in the foster care system for example with an alumni and with an alumni with a group of folks who've experienced the foster care system um i also do that so I'll, i will look at folks that i think have been under resourced historically and want to and want to work as much as possible in those spaces and look at folks who are founders who are doing something that i think is amazing 
Okay. And then I want to make sure so there's someone I'm working with, for example, through Roddenberry uh, right now, whose focus um, has to do with this thing called warrant clinics, which help yeah. people have outstanding warrants um, across in, in largely in um, cities, mostly in the southeast, but they're expanding largely in African-American communities in those cities and will clear up warrants so people can get IDs, get jobs like and so that for me is a really like it's it's a it's one of those things when I was first heard, I was like, this is so obvious that this should exist. This person was great. And so I put in have put in a lot of effort with that person. I'm just like, here's an opportunity to scale something big that make a huge difference a lot in many people's lives. So it's, you know, it's basically who has the, the fewest resources and who is someone where if I work with them, big things that can happen that can shift um have the potential to shift the lives of so many others in a variety of different ways right that that impact and s- scalable sustainable all those different things that come into play now when we are <laughs> talking about these things regarding rust how mm-hmm. is it that rust stays relevant and you don't burn out what are, what are you, the strategies that you take so one thing is so the a couple of years ago, I had I was thinking about what needed to be true of of my future work, and one of the most important pieces was that I will only work with folks that I really just love. So wow. part of it is it has to be people that working with them. It's it's always work on some level, but it's I have to just really enjoy them, appreciate them. Because I think a lot of like how I show up in the world is like is an act of love. Like it's cheesy, uh, but it's true and it's real. Um, right. Yeah, it's just it's like it's it's my truth, and so it's the way that I try to give back is to be super present for folks, especially those folks where I can see that there is a great need. Um, and so I think one thing is that there are people who replenish. Right. So there are people that in them like replenish you. Uh and it may be that they're doing something, but they're they verbalize their appreciation. Um, you enjoy the working with them. It's not a struggle most of the time. Like it's that I think that is that you're fed in some way in doing that particular work with them. So that's a really that's a really big part of it. Um, I think in COVID times I've learned to play a little bit more like I'm naturally very um I'm silly but I'm also like buttoned up in some ways around like my ability to like not be me I don't know that so like I've learned actually to like do like role playing like board games because like at least it sort of gives me a little bit of window out of my head because I'm in my head a lot of the time Uh, so I think that helps Okay. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it is just like it, I'm fed by people. Like there, I, I travel a lot, but I don't. The cities I go to don't matter as much as the people I meet in the cities that I go to, yeah. and eating well and eating really good food. Uh, <laughs> but like, like one of those things where and getting good books. Like I'm very much a bookstore and barbecue person. So like wherever <laughs> I go, I look for like independent bookstore and a place to get barbecue. I know what to uh, do. I know what to send you then, right? <laughs> Excellent. Um, but yeah, so, so I think that's like, that's the, it's just, it's recognizing, I think for each of us, what replenishes, what feeds us, um, who does that? Because yeah. there are lots of people, especially if you're like the servant leader type, uh, where there are plenty of folks who will, who will take, just, you know. Who, yeah, constant. Yeah. Constant. Exactly. exactly. So- so, um, man, this is, I have so many more questions, but we're going to just pause for a moment. So now we shift our attention just a little bit. We have talked about so much in regards to um, getting started, um, having this space um, that fuels us. And for you, Russ, um, that was the journey and the lived experience. um, And then you coming face to face with what it 
what it was like to have someone to believe in you and to communicate that, but yet what would have been different had you had that advisor, that counselor. And it's so interesting that you're in that role right now um, for, mm. for the world. Um, but then you also talked about um, strategy when it comes to working with groups and individuals. You also talked about strategy around, um, I love how you um, mentioned, which it was unexpected for me when you said people re will replenish and there are things that replenish and being intentional about that as you move forward. But in my research, I also found, yes. I also found some, some two things I want to touch on, but we're going to see how, yes. how much we can get through. Yeah. And the, this is your article that you wrote titled the one thing people almost always get wrong when networking. So when we're talking about strategy and the fact that everything you do is about people, yeah, what are we doing wrong then? Well, I think the challenge is, I think a lot of people, so one, networking makes people super anxious yeah. because I think that people think it's inauthentic, right? And so I think it, there is a there is a mindset shift of understanding that there's plenty of situations where both parties win, where both parties are better for the conversation. Um, and for me, because a part of my journey is I just really care about people being better off for our having met. So, you know, the the one thing there, honestly, is just how can I help you? And I think the challenges people have in their head a notion around power dynamic that makes them think, one, that the own that they cannot be of help to folks unless they have a more impressive title than the other person. Um, and so I think that that part of the approach is getting to know um the individual. So, you know, it's funny when you when you brought up the strategy word in the first half, because you know, the the my big thing from strength finders is individualization. Like I am like all about the notion of like, oh, so what do you want in your life? Like what's hard? Um, what do you wish you had more of? Like what are the things, what are the challenges you're currently facing? And then you realize like that for me was not it wasn't something that I was that I was like I read about and therefore I had to do it. It's just the natural, it's just my natural approach to things is that I recognize that people are often struggling with something. And for whatever e reason, I've I've always been very bad at small talk, uh, but very good at having like real talk. But it's so crazy because when we think yeah. about networking, yeah, that's the first thing we think of. Like, oh, okay, what do I want to talk? You know, what's going on in the world today? Um uh -huh. What, what, you know, what's the weather like? Um, what's, what project am I working on at work? But you're saying it shouldn't be small talk. I think a lot, I, I think depending upon who you are and right, there's introverts, there's extroverts. I think the big thing is it's just knowing what your style is, what makes you comfortable, being very present with the person that you're with. So if you're one of those people who's like looking around the room the entire time for someone better, people notice that um if you you know if you have an ability you know i think the the idea of having the pitch of who you are having a concise so i spend a lot of time working with people on their story uh because i believe that one so i'll very often say that people are in the weeds of themselves so, so what do you they, mean by helping us with our story i mean the, when you share with someone what the story of who you are as a professional is mm -hmm. people don't have one usually it's a long rambling thing yeah and it might be that all these things know, we do right it's a list yeah. versus like a three or four sentence narrative of oh you know actually for the last 20 years i've been doing x right now my current role is doing y and i'm particularly good at z and i what i'm really looking to do next or what i'm really looking for right now is the following like it could be super concise and just as a way that's memorable and shows that you're thoughtful that was very clear. What you <laughs> yeah. Like, and it was, it wasn't overwhelming because yeah. oftentimes, I mean, I've, I've been in way too many situ situations where every now, even myself, I've had to say, whoa, whew, that made me dizzy. You know, like yeah. I, I got off, you know, I got off the track, you know, <laughs> so where it's like, oh, and this and this, it's different if someone asks a little bit, yeah. tell me more, yeah. but I, 
I like what you just did because it it literally summed it up, but it, it had nothing to do with titles. Yeah. That, but you just say it. it. It could be in there depending. Okay. There, it depends on the, the person. Okay. The, the big thing, there's these weird things that people do that when it comes time to tell their story, they try to say, they almost all sound like they're consultants and they're trying to use industry language and industry language is tends to be either a people in the industry are super bored with it they've heard a million times like they don't know they, they're just like yeah yeah like uh or people who are not in the industry don't know what it means and therefore even if they could help you they can't because they don't know what you're talking about oh, but we don't so, think about that so finding like a simple way to talk about what you do in some ways can be way more elegant but it just takes work and it usually takes working with someone else who can tell you what they're hearing because it has to be language that's true to you. Mm -hmm. It has to be true to your experience. And so like, it's just finding ways to, so I remember like a person I worked with had been, had worked at a mortician as a mortician for several years uh, and had also served, uh, was a person who worked in like freshman dormitories at colleges. And I was just like, Oh, so like you help people, you'd help, people in very different states of their experience through very traumatic and emotional life experiences. Mm -hmm. And so you have the ability to show up in that way. And so some of this is just finding what the what the, the through line is and, and helping people like understand that. And I think that's even the case. So very often, if you're an outlier, if you've had an unusual career path, you have to guide people to understand that like you can't most people won't put in the work uh, or they can't put in the work mm -hmm. to figure that out. And so it's upon each of us to put in that kind of effort. And it helps very often. The reason why I love it, doing that work with folks is because it then uh, I think people then can lean into that. So let's start off first with what is yeah. it? Let's let's revisit what is networking? Because I think it is just a dirty word now. Yeah. And then... And Go from there. Mm -hmm. I would say good practitioners of it make it relationship building. Mm. And I think it's like building any other relationship. And there are people you build relationships with who are thoughtful, intentional, <laughs> who are think about you. Um, and there are those who are less good at that. And sometimes it may be because of things going on in their life. But there are people, there are people, so I will always talk about, for some people, they approach networking like strip mining. They take everything they can. And what happens is over time, people know that about them and they stop engaging with them. And they're just like, you know, this person shows up every couple of years because they want to meet someone. Um, they want a job recommendation. You're just like, but they don't make the effort to engage and connect. Um, and so that's, I think that's hard. Now, some people are more introverted and that makes it a little bit more difficult for them. But I think that's one of those ways in which, you know, you want to make someone feel like you're not just there when you're needed. Like, I will tell you honestly that when I, when someone is going through a really bad situation, I tend to go closer to them Okay. Uh, I have this notion in my head very often of like a little red balloon that's sort of flying off and can kind of go into this tinier and tinier dot uh, before you don't see it at all. And so sometimes my tendency, and this might be a little paternalistic at times, <laughs> is to want to be more present and make sure they feel supported, that they still matter, that it wasn't just about their title. Um, and And what I've seen is that the folks who do that, who who have like been that way for others, when the bad things happen, people weather the storm with them. Yeah. And those who were more, you know, who were less pleasant to work with or it felt like it was extractive, people disappear because they're like, you know what? I tolerated that person yeah. because of X and Y, but now I don't have to anymore. Yeah. And you mentioned that why most people are terrible at networking by giving you an example. You give this example that there is someone that you know who reaches out professionally whenever yes. she wanted something yeah. so there was only a, 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 so there's no other rhyme or reason of her in the past reaching out 
And, and it was never even like a, hey, how are you? <laughs> like, yeah. how are you doing? It was always just cut to the chase. I saw this thing. I want this thing. How can you help me get this thing? And can you, yeah, I know you can. And so while it can be flattering, that can get old over time because, and as you said, now you have a reputation. You're only going to call if you need something right. um, and there's no relationship. And I think we miss out on the this whole concept that networking is more about building relationship because the network is there when you need it. But if you feed that network, it works for you. You don't even have to look. In my experience, I don't necessarily have to look for anything because yeah. even if I just, there's a just an inclination that something's up or I'm needing something, I'm actually having to choose who is it that I want to work with on this situation because I've taken the time. Literally, there is on my calendar every other month individuals whose names are plugged in that I reach out to just to say, hey, and I always say sending a smile, a wave and a smile, hoping that all is going well. That leads to other conversations, but it has worked for years. And it's literally an appointment on my calendar. I have the same kind of practice. Mm -hmm. of checking. And you know, the, the other thing is, so I will say that I'm spoiled. I will go with a massive <laughs> assumption that you're spoiled on some level. Yes. That we're both in places where we're okay. Right. We have access to stuff. We're like, we know who we can reach out to. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we're, we're more comfortable than some folks might be, yeah. but we, our tendency is to not think of things from like a scarcity mindset. We see the range of possibility and we enjoy helping others like have better, more fulfilling lives and recognize that the world is better off when people are like maximizing who they are, whatever that is. Like, I'm not saying it has to be in work. There's a variety of ways that, you know, that we're more fulfilled if we're more connected and we're in more deeper relationship with people. Right. So I think a lot of it is that. I think the other thing that's actually the trickier part is not, so the trickier part is actually not about reaching out. Like, I think that what we both have kind of naturally done because we care about others and want to make sure that people are that we're thinking about them. I think most people can do that. Most people could, that's like a habit, right? That's a, that's a thing that you just sort of develop in the habit of the thing that's harder for people. And this may be an area where you and I have been blessed in some level is I just tend to remember the things that people want. And for me, it's a little bit like playing um, I forget the name, like, is it like apples to apples? Like those g games where you have to match up the two pictures, yes. like remembering where they were. And so on some level, like when I have a conversation with someone who's looking for a thing and I'm able to find someone who has that thing that's looking for something to connect with, like that for me is all the success. In the world. So there is a person actually, I haven't written you about, haven't mentioned you at all, who's in a fellowship um, in St. Louis, who's spending six months at a time there. She's doing super interesting work, uh, helping people, better ways for people to access um, SNAP benefits nationally through some new technology. And so I was like, I have to introduce the two y'all at some point because I'm like, you'll have a great conversation. Yeah. And so, but in my head, I'm just like, oh, here's the matches. That, I'm constantly thinking of the matches that need to happen that don't necessarily impact me. I just think they help those individuals and they help the world in some way that there's a there's an impact and so it's just it, it's just it's a it's both I'm able to match I like the game of that my head goes to that but also like for me it's joyous yeah. every time I help someone get a fellowship or get a grant or get something like it doesn't necessarily do that much for me it does something for the world yeah. and that for me is like is feeds me in ways that are different that other people don't conduct see the world in quite the same way and i get that like i i understand that that's true but from a networking perspective the value of saying like hey even if this isn't about serving my immediate needs mm -hmm. it's good to go and help other people because people remember that you helped them they remember that you cared like as a human being even beyond being a professional like it's meaningful to them but it's, and it's so interesting because as you make progress mm -hmm. in whatever industry, I don't care what it is, it could be 
um, you know, wrapping cough drops, keep, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, what is very interesting is that you have no idea how someone's path you've crossed will be the link to connect you to something that you didn't even know you needed. You didn't even know was even an opportunity. No different than when Allison made the connection between the two of us and our very first conversation, I'm like, this man head is wired somewhat like mine. Like mm -hmm. I've always fought even in the networking space, how do I fit in? Not mm -hmm. understand, like later understanding is the very thing that makes, that, that causes you not to fit in. That's your secret sauce, right? And right. so you can lead with that even when, and going back to that simplifying yeah, yeah. introduction, you can lead with that and be yeah. sure of that as you move forward. I like this other strategy that you've introduced, which is, I didn't think of it in that way to where it's a matter of not necessarily just always having to go out, pass out business cards, but no, with who you know, yeah. how do you begin to connect those dots? Yeah, yeah. It, Very there's, interesting. It, Less pressure. Yeah, and it isn't about how you're growing. Like, I know I'm going to get something from this on this date. Mm -hmm. It's just recognizing that you know, we talk when you're talking about opportunity presenting itself things kind of find a way to sort of float up. So I will tell you another thing that's really weird um, about me that helps from a networking perspective. I am socially, I think I'm somewhat awkward. I'm very good in a one-on-one -on -one is really easy for me because I want to go really deep. I want to understand someone, which could also be, could also be overwhelming for some people, right? Because you're like learning more and they're just like- I And you're already solving the world for them, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And they're just like, I don't think I want to do that. Um, but what's interesting is for me is being a little socially awkward means I'm equally awkward in the same way with everyone. So difference in some ways matters less for me. So all the differences that people may have um, kind of melt into the sort of overall notion of I'm socially awkward and everyone makes me uncomfortable in the same way, which actually is like it flattens it out. It makes me like I'm less focused on someone's position. I'm less focused on a different identity or experience. I'm much more focused on, oh, I'm having another conversation with a new person. And that's gonna that's kind of weird. And I've got to just be like, okay, we're having a conversation. <laughs> like and that's all I focus on. And that for me actually helps in some ways. It's less titular. It's it's less of the other stuff that I think people can get um can can be messed up around. You say in your article that you tend to often have professional relationships that cross over into the personal. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that is that we're often told not to do that. And you said, yeah. this is important to me, but it may not be your focal point. Therefore, the single best thing to say when you're networking is, how can I help you? Yeah. Not necessarily, can you do X, Y, Z for me? Yeah. I mean, the deal is if some, it's, it's a little bit like that thing um, when, when someone wants to meet someone to get a job mm -hmm. and you could say, you know, actually, if someone has a job available, if they meet you and they like you and they've learned about you, they might go and say, oh, you know, we actually do have a job doing X. They may know you, you can go and say, yeah, you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm making this pivot. I'm thinking about things. I'm looking at these industries, looking to have conversations. The moment they know that you're looking for a job at their company, it immediately creates this like, oh my God, I can't guarantee them that. And they're going to be pushing me. It's going to be uncomfortable. People always have the right and they know that to go and say, oh, here's an opportunity that might be a good fit. Here's a person you should talk to. And so sometimes like holding that back really helps. It makes them, you know, you sort of like, you know, making the cat come to you versus chasing after it. <laughs> Uh, kind of thing, like allowing that to happen. Yeah. It's just, it's recognized the dynamics sometimes are really uncomfortable for others. And so that, that can help quite a bit. Yeah. You said that it's worth remembering that you're having a conversation, not just with one person when you're networking, but mm -hmm. also with the whole network of that person. Mm-hmm. 
how profound is that? Because again, back to you have no idea where that connection could possibly lead to. So now this takes us full circle to when you said at the beginning, don't become that person who calls when you just need something, because guess what? That's now communicated to that person's network. And I have done that before. There are people when I introduce them, I won't, I won't usually say that that particular piece because at some point I'll stop introducing them because I'm like I know that their game is they're going to be extractive and I don't want people to feel like I only introduce them to extractive people and then they're coming back to you saying what did you do what is this yeah, Russ, yeah, what yeah. did you set me up for it's, I, yes I mean absolutely and I mean although I will tell you that as someone who does so much stuff for free you know the only thing I ever ask for pe of people is just like hey if I come to you and ask to chat with someone just have a conversation with them. That's the only request I make of you. But yeah, it's definitely a thing where you want to have a better reputation for making connections with people that are nice, even if they're not like a person that's going to help the other person per se for a bunch of reasons. It, sometimes, so for example, if you're 23 uh, and you've just graduated from college and you're just like, you know, what do I know? I've not really had a full-time job anywhere. Um, and how can I be helpful to that person? Like, I actually think very often you're understanding, you know, if you're talking to a vice president of whatever, um, who's in their 50s, your understanding of technology and social media, a set of things is far greater than theirs. And they may have challenges with that, that you can help untangle. Yeah. And and so it's part of it is like, is is being present in that way. And also letting the other person know, like, yeah, I could see why that thing would be hard for you without judging or making them feel less. Like, we we all, so many of the people that I learn from um, are people who are younger than I am, who have just expertise that's just like their lived experience, their work experience is so different. And, and as long as I don't get caught up in this thing of like, well, I'm supposed to know this by this point, or I have to know more than them in all things, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, like, so it's just being open to the fact that people will know more about you. In fact, like, I, I, I think we both share this thing of like, I am super attracted to people and I want to hear more from people who have a, had an entirely different path. Yeah. Like, that's how I learn. That's how I begin to understand something yeah. is by like, oh, here's like, you've opened up the key has been opened about something that was previously closed and like, oh, yeah. that connects with other things that could be really helpful. And so it's just like, if you think of, if you gamify connecting with people as this opportunity to open up all these possible pathways, yeah. not just for yourself, but for all the other people, you know, like imagine what you're able to do. So I heard from, I have a, um, a third cousin who reached out to me, who wants to develop, uh, who wants to become a developer of uh, tabletop games, okay. like a super specific thing. And I know someone who owned a game store, who's now doing this stuff. And so like, I can go and I can make that thing happen. Mm -hmm. And like for me, my ability to, to close, to hear about a thing and close something like that in like 24, 36 hours, like that's the best thing in the world. Like there's a person who's stuck with no idea to reach out to who's been struggling for months to try to find a way and it's like oh i can do this person who can then introduce you to 10 other people that they who's know in the industry are. right and, right and, and so i think that's the thing is either you find that like it's a mindset shift that you that you take joy yeah. in being the person who connects people to other people you have the, the platform um but another platform because we know you you have several um, to convey one message to individuals who are looking to take it to the next level, you know, professionally, whether it's um, um, an innovator or a, a leader of an organization, what one thing would you tell them in regards to um, when it comes to strategy and or um, building their network? I think... I think the biggest thing is it's one, it's knowing what you're really after. It's knowing what you're trying to do. Like you're trying to to build a network for what reason? Okay. You're trying to launch a thing for what reason? 
And then once you know what that thing is, who is the best person or people to help you get there? Because I think part of what happens is we often isolate ourselves in our moments of greatest need. We feel like we're struggling or we have to be perfect. Uh, and we're all messy. And it's just Talk really about, about finding, <laughs> it's just about finding the people that can give you the honest feedback, who can help you to better understand yourself, better understand what you're trying to achieve, and that you can hear, right? You don't have baggage with, you can hear them, and they can help you be better and support you along the way. Wow. There we go. Russ Finkelstein provides a message in the nick of time. Thank you so much, Russ, for giving us this time. I mean, there's so many jewels that even I am like going to have to go back and watch this myself because, again, we make it so complex. But the way you've simplified some of this and taken out the the angst of all of it is um, quite impressive. And I thank you once again for making the time. We appreciate it. I am going to list your um, website, your link. Um on the um on all our social media platforms but individuals who want to learn more about you can find you where i mean I, the, there's russfinkelstein.com which is a coaching thing but i'd probably you know looking for me on linkedin or LinkedIn. the washington post I, I said i will my goal is not really i'm not necessarily looking for more business right. i am always <laughs> looking to be to help people find the person that would help them yeah. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Russ, you for, um, for making time. I want to thank also our sponsors, um, Ah TV Network, ALA Public Relations, All in Media, Music and Media, KSTL Jubilee 690 AM Mosaic, Selling and Sparkman Pathway to Careers. Want to also thank each and every one of you in your respective places. Thank you so much for giving us your hands, well, your ears, your head, and we've now given you something to place in your hands to go and continue living out success as you define it. Understanding that you don't want to just stay there because as you just learned from Russ, we need to begin to tiptoe our way into significance, which is being able to impact the world. So until next time, I want you to continue to show up and share out in the nick of time.